Well, I got three different options that uh, could interest you today, something that you could have. Uh, here's a book. It's called Rich Toward God. It's by Dr. Greg Craig Hood. I've gotten some uh, good information, a few good ideas in my sermon out of this book. And so if those of you bookworms out there, this might be something you'd like to go home with today. You could possibly do that. If that's not you, any coffee drinkers in the house? Any coffee drinkers? Yes, right here, the old Northside logo coffee mug. You could walk out with one of these today. That is uh, certainly an option for you, or you could just leave today with some cold cash right here. And these are not ones, by the way. They're not ones. So on the count of three, I just want you to say what you would like to have today as you walk out of here. You ready? One, two, three. Okay. I heard cash. Someone said mug. And I know this wasn't really fair because uh, this means either you're a nerd or you're a caffeine addict or a materialist. That pretty much is what I just uh, did there, but not really. But you know what? Most of you said cash, and, and I understand that. And the reason is because, as people say, money talks, right? Money talks. Now, we all know that money doesn't have a voice in and of itself, but our beliefs about money, our beliefs about money gives it a loud voice in our lives. And, and that is why we've been in this series called Money Talks, because it does. M- money talks. And And as we've been going through this series, we've been talking about the lies that we buy into when it comes to money. I mean, money gets your attention. Money gets your interest. Money's something we all want. And we've also found in this series that it's one of the chief competitors to God. It's money. And so God talks a lot about it. And we've just been trying to expose these lies. And here's how we've been doing it. We've been using Luke chapter 12, where Jesus told the story about a a rich farmer who had a harvest And he had this incredible windfall, and he just stored it and hoarded it and consumed it all for himself. He wanted all of it for himself. And here's what Jesus calls that man. He says he is a fool. He's a fool. He's a fool because he was rich in this life, but he was not rich toward God. He was a fool because he was prepared for this life, but he wasn't prepared for the next He was a fool because he was using it all for himself instead of leveraging it for the kingdom of God. And as we've been going through this series, in week one, we said the lie that we buy into is that it's all about the money. It's all about the money. And we said that whenever you live life like that, it's all about the money. What happens is you leave God out of your money decisions What happens is you don't acknowledge him as your source of wealth. What happens is you begin to trust in what you have rather than in who provided it to you. And so in week one, we just realized, you know, it's not all about the money. And then last week, we talked about this lie, it's all about you. It's all about you. And we we expose the lie by saying that what Jesus said is it's not all about you because it is more blessed, even if you weren't here last week, you already know where this is going, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And last week we said that if you could go through a door that in, in which if you went through that single door, like right over there on the side of the room, that if you went through that door, you would be blessed. Would you want to go through that door? And we we're all like, yeah, we want to go through a blessed door. Well, what if you had this door over here, the double wide, that, that is more blessed. Would you want to go through that door? And we're all like, uh, yeah, we'll switch our allegiance from blessed to more blessed. We'd be happy to do that. And then we quoted this scripture, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And then a lot of us were thinking, uh, I think I'll just go be happy with that first door because our belief system says that it's more blessed to receive. And Jesus saying, no, it's more blessed to give. It's not about you. It's more blessed to give. And this morning, I want to expose a third lie that was present in the rich man in Luke chapter 12. And here's the lie. It's all about today. It's all about today. That's how he lived. This rich farmer believed That this life was all that mattered. Carpe diem. Seize the day. It was all about his comfort. It was all about his security, about his his ease, about his happiness, about his wealth. It was about today. Everything he had today. That's what it was about. But the problem was he was so focused on this life, he was not prepared for eternity. And when he died, he had nothing to show for it. And here's what Jesus said about this man in Luke 12, 21. He said, this is how it will be with anyone. Any one of you, this is how it will be, who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. You will die with nothing to show for it. 
At the end of life, the only thing that matters is what we've invested with the Lord. The only thing that matters is what we have sent on ahead into eternity. 2 Peter 3.10 says that the earth will be laid bare and everything in it. That's what's going to happen at the second coming of Christ. The earth will be laid bare and everything in it. There will be nothing left. Everything that you live for, you save for, you consumed, it is only for here, not there. So we want to live in such a way that we can become rich toward God. We want to live in such a way that we'll be prepared not just for life here, but life for eternity. So here's what I want to do. If you have your Bible or device, I want you to open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Because for two weeks, we taught on Luke chapter 12. And I've said about everything I can say from that story in Luke 12. And so what I want to do today is I want to look at some other scriptures that supplement, that come right alongside Luke chapter 12, that will reveal, here's how you are rich toward God. Here's how you become rich toward Him. And and so I want to give a little context here to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the very first text we're going to read today. And the context is the Apostle Paul, on his third missionary journey, he is communicating to this church in Corinth because he's challenging them to give generously of what they have to the, the poor Christians in Judea. They have little to nothing. They're struggling. They're, they're going through great hardship. And Paul had challenged them to give, and they said they would. In fact, he used their promise to give as encouragement to the Macedonians. The Macedonians had already given and supplied out of what they could give. And now he's looking back at Corinth, and the Corinthian church there uh, hadn't been storing up anything. They hadn't been saving anything to give, and he's concerned that they're not going to have anything to really give generously like they at once had said. He realized they need a little encouragement. You need to start now. Don't wait till the end. Start giving now. That's something we all could use a little bit of encouragement with from time to time. But Paul knew if they would give generously to those who were in need in Judea, it would do two things. Not only would it be able to allow them to be generous to relieve their hardship, but the other thing is it would show the unity of the church. Because you had Gentiles in Corinth who were going to be giving to Jews in Judea. And it would show in a, in a world where there was a lot of division that Christians are united around the cross of Christ. There is no racial, ethnic barriers that should exist. And uh, so anyway, here's what Paul says. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7, and then 10 through 12. He says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And what Paul begins by saying is that there's a direct correlation between your sowing and your reaping. Farmers know that. When you sow more, you can reap more. Investors know that. When you invest more, you can reap more. Christians should know that because when we're more generous in the kingdom, we too will experience a greater harvest for the kingdom. And then he says this, though. Something is different between us and farmers and us and investors. It doesn't matter what the farmer's attitude is like when he puts the seed in the ground and plants it. It's going to grow. It doesn't matter what the investor's attitude is like whenever he invests that. It should, if it's in a healthy stock or bond, whatever, it's going to grow. But the attitude of the Christian does matter. God loves a cheerful giver. The word cheerful means hilarious. Hilarious giver. I mean, where you just, you love to give to the Lord. Sometimes you've seen video of, of people and they're bringing their offerings and they're all dancing. Or you see, I, I, in Africa, I actually watch this. They have a whole little line and they're dancing, going crazy, bringing their offering. And we can learn from that, actually, what it means to give joyously to God. They're celebrating what they can give because he's provided for them. It's pretty cool. And Paul agrees with this. In fact, he's the initiator of this. We, we should give cheerfully. But he goes on to say this. He says, now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it is overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. And what Paul is saying is money is seed. Money is seed. And God gives you seed to sow and he gives you food to eat. He gives you seed to sow. He gives you food to eat. And if you sow the seed that he gives you, 
You can be more generous because it'll reap a harvest. You can be generous on every occasion. And so the giving of money, what we see here is that when we do that for the kingdom, people will give thanks to God. They will glorify God. It will be a blessing to people. And what we need to realize is that giving money to the kingdom is an act of worship, just like when you sing and raise your hands in worship and lift, lift up your voices in worship. It is an act of worship, just like when you pray to God. Your spiritual act of worship is also seen in your giving. And what I want us to realize here is several things. I, I want to Demonstrate how we can be rich toward God. How to be rich toward God. And the first way is this. Judge today. Judge today by the seeds you plant, not the harvest you reap. Judge today by the seeds you plant, not the harvest you reap. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 says that God gives us bread for eating and seed for sowing. And here's the principle in the Bible. That when you have what you need... You eat that. That's called the, you know, the bread of sustainability. Whatever's going to sustain you, you use that. That is for your needs. But whatever you don't need to sustain you, that is your abundance. And that should be sowed. And so bread for eating is based on sufficiency. That's why Jesus said, pray daily. You know, God, you know, give us our daily bread. Give us what we need today. But the seed for sowing is based on abundance. So you can increase your sharing. Your generosity. But here's the problem. When God provides for us an abundance, instead of increasing our giving, we often increase our eating. Instead of increasing our standard of giving, we increase our standard of living. In other words, we're eating the grain, we're eating the seed that was intended for sowing. Now, to illustrate this, I want to use, uh, we have a Kairos course that we use here at Northside. Jessica Goodrich facilitates this course. She was kind enough to send me some pictures out of this that, I, that just really resonated with me when I went through it and loved it. And in this little graph that you see here up on the screen in this picture, the person on your right, person number one, you see that they started off with five seeds. That's what's, that, that's what's at the very top, on the top left. They had five seeds, and they ate two of those seeds on the far right. They ate two of them. That left them three for planting. And each of those seeds produced two more seeds. And that gave them six. They ate two of the six, and those four, then they got two out of each of those. That gave them eight. They consumed two of those. That leaves them with six, right? They, they, they have six seeds for sowing. They consumed what they needed. They sowed the rest. And you can see that they have a harvest. They have an abundance. They have enough for sharing. When you look at person number two on the right, on, uh, the, the right side of your screen, what you're going to see there is they too started off with five seeds, but they felt like they needed three, not two, to consume. So they consumed three. three. That left two for uh, planting. And those produced two more, so they had four, but they live off three, and so they took three of the four. They now have one left. It, too, produced two. They now have two, but they need three. So now they don't even have enough for eating, and they also don't have enough for sowing. Yeah, we're, we're following this. They can't share. They can't even be generous. They can't make an impact in the world. They cannot advance the kingdom because they're consuming more than they're sowing. And so if that's what's going on, I think one of the questions we need to ask is, is it possible to increase your standard of giving without increasing your standard of living? It is possible, because I'm going to give you an example of a guy who did it that will blow your mind. And it's right here, John Wesley, an English revivalist who lived from 1703 to 1791. I want you to look at his income. Again, this was an English revivalist. We're talking pounds here. We're not talking dollars. He lived on 30 pounds his first year. His expenses were 28 pounds. That's what it took for him to live. That was his standard of living. He gave away two pounds as a generous gift. In year two, he doubled his income. He was making 60 pounds. But his expenses remained at 28. He gave away 32. In year three, 90. 90 pounds. That was his income. But he continued to live off 28. So he gave away 62, and as you go through the years, there came this year when he made 1,400 pounds. He lived on 30. He gave away 1,370. And John Wesley demonstrates that the way he lived his life was to increase his standard of giving, not his standard of living. Something we probably ought to think about. Sir Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. 
And what we see in 2 Corinthians is that Paul is saying God will give seeds to those who will sow it. To those who will sow the seed, to those who will use it, God will, will produce a harvest and will give more so that you can be generous. Not so that you can consume more for yourself, it's so that you will be generous. God gives more to those who prove faithful. That's a, a biblical principle in Corinthians. And one of the things I was reading that I found really interesting is I was reading a study that was done, and here's what it said. It said, if all church members in America lost their jobs and tithed from their welfare payments, their contributions would raise by 35%. It would actually benefit the church and the kingdom of God if you all would lose your jobs and then start tithing. Now, I'm not saying that that is exactly the case here at Northside Christian Church, but that is the case in the church of America at large. We're increasing our standard of living, but we're not increasing our giving. Now, I know that Christians are the most generous people on the planet. Any research that his will show that. You compare us to any other religion, any other non-religion, atheist, anyone else, and we are crazy generous comparatively worldwide. However, let's not get too excited about that. Because there's another graph that I came across that showed this. It showed that 98.1% of our income we use on ourselves. 98.1%. A little different than John Wesley. We share 1.8% with Christian institutions. And we share 0.1% for foreign mission. That's the church at large. Not a great commentary on our generosity. And yet the scriptures really speak differently than that. Like 1 Timothy 6, 18 through 19, in which Paul tells this young preacher, Timothy, who would have been standing in front of his church to say this. Here's what you say. Was Paul writing his sermon for him? Yeah, pretty much it's Scripture, so that's what you do. You read Scripture and you got it. He said, command them to do good. Command who to do good? Well, earlier he said, the rich among you. That's us. For in America, we're rich compared to the rest of the world. Command the rich among you to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. In other words, we need to share today to store up treasure in heaven tomorrow. We need to share today to store up treasure in heaven tomorrow. Sharing generously, it's a direct deposit into that coming age. Not the one now, the coming age. The only way to win in this life is if we use what we have today to advance the kingdom. If we would do that, it's a win. It's a win for us, it's a win for church, it's a win for everyone. Because when you use your money to bring heaven to earth, to show people Jesus, to show people the heart of God, when you use your money to bring heaven to earth, it's going to change the world. And then when you use your money to advance the kingdom by helping people on earth get to heaven, that is a win for the kingdom. And if you don't approach your money in this way, you will not have a firm foundation. Instead, you will be laying for yourself that which is going to fall in an instant. When you realize everything you've been working for is for this life, but not for the one to come. And that is why I've been saying in this sermon, it's not about today. It is about the kingdom. It is not about today. It is about eternity. It's not about today. It is forever with God. But here's the catch. Once you realize it's not about today, it's about the kingdom. It's about forever. It's about eternity. Then you realize, so it is about today. It is about what I do with what I have today. If it's not about today, then it is about what I'm, how I'm using everything I have today for them. Because what I do today is determine whether or not I have treasure in heaven. It's not about today, but it's all about today. That's what I'm saying. So what are you going to do today? I think Jesus speaks to this when, in Matthew 25 when he's talking about the judgment and us standing before God one day. And here's what he says in Matthew 25, 34 to 36, and then verse 40. He says, then the king will say to those on his right. Here's what Jesus is doing right here. He's saying to those on his right. Come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, 
and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, brothers of mine, you did for me. When we give our time, when we give our money, our resources to someone who's in need, we're given to Jesus. Jesus referred to the hungry, people who are hungry. About one in seven people do not have enough food to eat. Nine million people in the world will die of hunger-related causes just this year. Nine million people, people are hungry. Jesus referred to people who are thirsty. Imagine walking for hours just so you can get to some water for your family, but when you do, it's filled with parasites and bacteria. That's the plight of 1.2 billion people on our planet. People are thirsty. Jesus referred to those who need clothes, who are sick, and they're in prison. If you took all the kids who are orphaned because of AIDS and you were to line them up hand in hand, one after another, you would form a chain from New York to Los Angeles five times. And what I want to do for just a moment is I want to expand our thinking to think about how when we leverage our resources and our everything that we have now for the kingdom of God, it's bringing heaven to earth and it's helping people on earth get to heaven. I want you to see the opportunities that are before us. And so I want you to give your attention to the screen, to this video that's going to play at this time. See, there is a caste system in heaven, but it's exactly backwards from the caste system this world naturally creates. This world applauds and esteems the wealthy and the powerful and the privileged and the talented. That's not how God's system works. Jesus came and he proved it. He took the lowest spot and he was God. The bigger you get in the kingdom of heaven, the lower position you take. The special ones in God's kingdom are the weak ones. The ones who can't fight for themselves, the ones that can't speak for themselves, the ones that don't have someone to feed them, the ones that don't have someone to protect them. And Jesus says, those are the prized ones. And you treat them as the royalty here on earth. And the way you treat them is ultimately the way you're treating me. What you do unto the least of these is how you're ultimately treating your God. Christianity is taking what has been purchased by the cross, the behavior of heaven, nature of Jesus Christ and transplant it into the heart of men and women down here on earth so that they behave not like this world but like heaven and so when this world sees them they're different there is something odd about them they are from another realm what does it look like it's noble it's brave it's courageous it's selfless it is willing to spend itself for the weak I was doing some study on Liberia. If you want to be disturbed, start studying Liberia. This four-year-old boy who's sitting on the side of the road, no one to comfort, no one to take him in, no shelter, no food, nothing. So in the middle of that night, I wake up. And it's like God had already deposited a question. It was waiting to meet me when I popped awake in the middle of the night, two in the morning. I had this picture of this little boy in Liberia in front of me. And God asked me a question. What if that was Hudson, my four-year-old? Eric, well, what if that was Hudson? Uh, you don't mess with a father's heart. What if that was Hudson? If my boy was on the side of a road across the world from me, suffering, totally alone, not knowing what's happening. He's not old enough to comprehend this. He's abandoned. He has no one to fight for his cause, no one to give him a voice. He doesn't even know how to articulate his circumstances. He's hungry and no one's feeding him. He's starving to death. If my son is in that situation, stick a concrete wall in front of me and I claw through it with my bare hands. This is my son we're talking about. And if I couldn't get there, I would call up every friend I have. And I would say, I have a son over in Liberia. You call yourself my friend. I need you to get on a plane. And I need you to get to him. I'll give you the coordinates. I'll do whatever it takes. But I need you to get to my son and be a father to him. God's response. Eric, that's my Hudson. That is my Hudson. 
he's looking to us and he's saying I'm calling up everyone I know everyone on my list that calls himself by my name that says they're a friend of God and I'm saying my son is over in Liberia are you willing to get on the plane and get to him we have a cause but we don't want to see it and it's when we finally acknowledge the fact that something is wrong with us not with the world out there if we start with this little group here and we say God you need to fix this I suffer from depraved indifference so do you oh we care it's not that that doesn't move us at some level to hear about this little child over in Liberia. We care, but we can go home tonight and sleep just fine. How is that? It's because there's an indifference to that life. And it's naturally born within us that that life isn't affecting us. It's not in our backyard. We're not related to it. It's someone else's issue. In fact, we start quoting scriptures about God being a father to the fatherless. We're like, thank you, God, that you're a father to that child. He says, uh, remember, you call yourself my body. I'm not there, except through you. Your hands, Eric, those are my hands. Your feet, those are my feet. That heart, that's my heart. And if it's not beating, my heart's not beating on this earth anymore. I work through my body. I'm a father to the fatherless through my body. I rescue the weak and the vulnerable through you. And if you're not doing it, no one is. I don't think it is that we don't care, but I do think this can be overwhelming at times. I mean, I read a bunch of statistics to you from New York to Los Angeles five times. You think, man, how can we make a difference in that? I want you, to, I want you just to come back for a moment to the words of Jesus, what he said in Matthew 25, 40. Whatever you did for one, whatever you did for one of the least, of these. Maybe you can't do it for everybody, but you can do it for somebody. Maybe you can't do it for everyone, but you can do it for someone. You can do it for one. I think people are ready. The world is ready. I think the church is ready for people just to know us for our love. I think they're ready to see that we love people. That's not, it's not just about what we do. It's not just about what we believe, but it's about who we love. This is what it means to make a difference. And when we use our money, our resources, when we use it for the kingdom of God, it speaks. Money talks. When we put our money where our mouth is, it shows the love of Jesus. On Christmas Day, whenever we had extra Christmas meals, and Tony and Jennifer Wilson just took them and loaded them in their car because all the other routes were, were on their way and were headed out there, they just went in their car and they just drove around Springfield looking for homeless people. You should have, you should have seen the look on their face when they got a hot meal and another box of cold dessert, mind blown. Since then, they've gone on their own to do that, making their own meals and going around Springfield and just taking it to the homeless people they find. That is storing up treasure in heaven, giving a firm foundation for the age to come. They're living for something else other than today. And so Jesus would say in Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to you. What Jesus is saying in that text is that when you seek the kingdom first, you don't have to worry about God's provision for today. He'll take care of those needs. Don't worry about today. You don't even have to worry about tomorrow because you're seeking the kingdom of God. You don't have to worry about eternity. You don't have to worry about life forever with God. When you invest in the kingdom of God, you're building a foundation that's going to last. And the rich man thought that the best way to prepare for the future was to hoard everything today. He was going to hoard it all. And Jesus says, no, the best way to prepare for the future is to be generous today. Then you won't have anything to worry about tomorrow. I know a lot of times when we think about the future, when we think about our provision, we think of investing. We think of retirement, we think of stocks, we think of bonds, we think of mutual funds, we think of investing for our future. And that would be wise to do that because then if you do so, then you can be generous in the future as well and not just now. So it is wise to invest for the future. But one of the things that stood out to me when I was reading this book, Rich Toward God, one of the things that stood out to me is he was talking about the fact that sometimes we limit what we're going to give to God and give to the kingdom because we don't think in terms of everything God has given us. And one of the things that 
was brought to light in the book is he said, it might surprise you to know that of all the accumulation of wealth in the United States, only 14% of it is cash. Of our wealth in the United States, only 14% is cash. The other 86% of wealth is invested in stocks and bonds and land and other appreciative assets. And so one of the things that he was pointing out here is when we think of of giving to the kingdom of God and we only think about cash, we are so limiting what God really desires of us. Obviously, there's things we can give that's not money at all that we can give for the kingdom. But he went on to just describe these other assets that we have that can be used for the kingdom. He specifically mentions stocks and things like that. In fact, that happens occasionally here at Northside. Just last week, we got 35 shares of O'Reilly stock there a week and a half ago or whatever it was that was given to the church. It could be used uh, for ministry purposes. People do those kinds of things because they realize those are ways in which they can give. And in the book, I was reading an illustration which Dr. Hood talks about a guy in his church that had given a significant gift of stock to his church for a ministry project that they had going on for one of their purposes. And about a year later, a little over that, he was wondering to himself, I wonder what that would have been worth if I had kept it. Maybe not something you should do, uh, but he was wondering that to himself. What should, if I had kept that, what would it be worth today? And he was like, you know, it could be worth it. He didn't know. He went and he looked and uh, he discovered that in the time that uh, since he had given that stock to the church, that the stock had dropped 92%. In fact, what he realized was, if I had held on to that stock, it would have been worth eight cents on the dollar. He was so glad that when he felt impressed by God to give, that he gave. And I just want you to know, giving to God is not just about giving money to accomplish his work. It's about caring for people's hurts and pains. Every decision you make to advance the kingdom shows that you're keeping your eyes on your true home, on heaven. The good we do today, the money we give today, the people we care for today, they're all part of the treasure. And by investing this treasure with God, we have access to more and more treasure, more good to do. I don't know what all that's going to look like or how God's going to do that, but we find that we have more people to care for, we have more money to be generous with, that God grows his riches both now and in the age to come when we are generous with him. And what Paul says is when you live that kind of life, you you will take hold of the life that is true life, life with God. 